Brian from Kunama Real Estate. Just come on in. This has just been made vacant. We've got the main compartment here of our fantastic snow cave. This snow cave is going to be available for let for another four weeks. Get in now while you've got the chance. Come on in. Come in. Come look here. Here's your storage area. Beautiful. Plenty of room to put your packs. Everything's in there. Come on through to the main living area here. There's your living room. Plenty of storage area as well. Fantastic bedroom for the mistress out the back here. Fantastic view of the snow. Plenty of snow. And we've got the main bedroom over here. This is the fantastic main bedroom for the Tunama Lodge, which is vacant to be lit. Out this way, out this way, sir, out this way. Also in this very valuable property, we have a fully serviced kitchen unit, which you can see just along here. Come along, come along. Here we go. Here's our chef in his own designer kitchen. There's your shovels, dig your own shelves. Too easy. How do you like kitchen, chef? It's worked pretty well. It's been good. Worked excellent. And through here, it's the kids' room. Kids! How do you like your room? How do you like your room? Oh, ho, ho. Four weeks to go. Come and buy. Get your real estate right now. Kunama Valley. What a view. Oh. <laughs>
uh, I don't put it down to anything else because the, uh, the people are still alive, they still love to do it, they still would like to see it continue. But as I say, well, the circumstances and the facility, and on top of that, then uh, the law that forbids you to go over the snow, that's, it's a bit hard, it's a bit hard. And they used to stay in that hut over there, what's it called? Kunama hut Kunama. or something like that? Kunama. 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 Right. Well, that's the, <laughs> it's the Aboriginal word, the Ngarigo word for snow. Kunama. Yeah. Although the white fellas might say Kunama. But it's, you'd say for Kunama. Snow. I've seen it spelt with a G too. G is K. Our journey begins on a frosty morning in mid-October. Although the ski resorts had closed for the end of the winter season, the main range high country still beckons us to ski. The Golden Eagle Run has lured a new generation of adventurer. The historical journey begins. Packs, which are loaded provisions necessary for an assault on the frozen wilderness, are firmly tied down prior to the river crossing. The, the anticipation of the freezing yeah. water is green and grins. In there. Yeah. Cool. Waters of the Snowy River, these mountain fresh streams are crystal clear. The water temperature is barely above freezing point. This great river begins a journey way up in the high country, the very roof of Australia. The melting snow and ice of winter flows towards a junction known as the crossing. And from here, struggling with the paralyzing effects of the freezing water, the supply sled is manhandled across the river. Several times the burden is almost lost as the group make their way across. The sled weighs in excess of 200 kilograms and a massive effort is needed to haul the cargo as no other snow transport is allowed in this part of the Alpine wilderness. At the midpoint of the crossing, a sleeping bag is dropped off the back. They must continue forward though, as if they drop their supply sled, all their provisions will be ruined. The snow on the other side initially feels warmer than the water that just exited. Slowly, a burning, piercing sensation takes over as your feet come back from the brink of the frost pot. Tickles off! Oh. Yeah. How do you feel, my feet? sleeping bag that was dropped in across his fanned out, being so tightly wrapped for the trip, the bag hardly even got wet. Hey, hey, I'm hardcore. Oh, big fella, there's those bizos for you guys. Once past the river and the landscape becomes devoid of trees, the vegetation of herbaceous perennial grasses and shrubs dominates the region. The area is known as the main range of the Australian Alps, where high winds and extreme temperatures have created a uniquely adapted environment. Life pushes through melting snow, clings precariously within this fragile alpine environment. Australia's mainland tundra begins at the other side of the river and continues to the highest peaks. In European American mountains, the cool tundra begins at altitudes of about 4,000 metres. In the Australian Alps, the tundra begins at altitudes as low as 1,600 metres. Following the valley line, the group passed Clark East Ridge and below the glacial lake of Club Lake. Kanama Valley lies between Mount Clark and Mount Lee, with the ridge line of Northcote Face predominating the valley features. The region provides a natural corridor through to the valley, and the group make their way along, and the last part of their journey and their destination, Kanama.
The valley is a natural amphitheatre rising nearly 300 metres, the peak being just short of Australia's highest mountain, Mount Kosciuszko. Kanama's sheer slopes with dramatic shoots equal some of the best skiing available. There's no wonder why they chose this place in the 1950s to develop a ski resort. The Golden Eagle Run was born out of an idea to ski straight down these massive slopes in 1953, with only the fastest skiers being awarded the Golden Eagle Badge. Built way above the tree line, Kanama Valley's development was on par with other ski resorts in Australia at the time. The lift easily accessed most of the valley and skiers were able to choose from a wide variety of advanced terrain. The valley is in the location named after the Aboriginal word for snow, Kanama. Largely unchanged since the 1950s, to stay here today means digging snow caves. The snow's properties enable it to be easily carved and shaped as temporary accommodation against the elements. The caves are directly dug into the slope and slowly the camp structure begins to take shape. All hands pitch into the tunneling as the work is time consuming. The caves are built in full view of the speed slope in the background. The snow maintains an even temperature inside. The thick mass is nature's own insulation against the freezing elements. Another load is placed onto the sled as the caves become deeper. Well, we're going to slowly build a three-man sleeping area in here for uh, our own personal use. And a bit yeah. The snow will provide their very shelter and blocks are easily carved to form a protective entrance against the wind. The kitchen unit is sculptured and the snow is flattened. Say so a bit of tomato, look at the tomato. Main range. Decadence. Salami. Hey Carl, can you pass that mayo? I'm glad to be stuffing my face with a sandwich. Finally, food. <laughs> As I'm walking around the ruins, just amazing. Um, I'm looking at something that I can only really think about, as I've only been told about. Um, the stories of the lift that ran here, the hut that was here, and the avalanche that took it out, and the fire that took place that took out the lift hut as well. And the actual Golden Eagle run itself. It's quite amazing. And then you look around here, and there are a couple of motors. One I'd say was a generator, the other would have been a lift drive motor. Fire extinguishers look like they've actually ruptured from explosion, not been used to put out a fire. Obviously, there was no one there um, that could get to them. Um, there's everything. There's saw blades and there's spark plugs and tools that are just burnt out and rusted and and worn through time, erosion and the forces of nature. Um, it's a little bit of a testament to. Like man's um, wanting to be out here and, and doing the things he loves most, the effort it must have taken to bring tons of equipment by hand, um, mostly down the steep slope. I wonder how many people have tried to pull this dipstick out. <laughs> oh wow, it's amazing. The tenacity of the people that used to come out here in those days and have to drag all this stuff out here. The tow hut was burned out in 1957 with a Kanama avalanche tragedy occurring the previous year. Adrian Studley recalls the morning of the avalanche. The tow hut that had three bunks in the end of the kitchen, so we used to look after ourselves. And uh, I can remember it was about seven o'clock in the morning. There was a commotion at the door, and a poor chap barges through just in his pajamas. He'd staggered across probably 100 to 150 yards from. Uh, Kanama itself to let us know that something had gone wrong. He didn't know what it was. He just he was thrown out the window and <laughs> in the snow and he wandered across. So we got dressed and went out and sure enough she'd gone in the avalanche. So um, my brother and I we just set to and we counted for everybody except for Rosalind. So 
we found basically where she was supposed to be sleeping, so that's where we started to dig. And it was snowing like mad and um, in the end we did find her probably down about five or six feet, five feet probably. And uh, she had a beam across her, uh, her neck, which was most unfortunate. But, uh, when we cut that off her, uh, it was snowing like mad, it was just coming down in buckets. And, uh, I can still remember we lifted her up onto the edge uh, of the hole that we dug and the sun came out. It was eerie. But uh, then it all came came back in again and just snowed for the rest of the day. And Ken Brakes me and myself, we uh, went to the chalet to talk to the parents and let everybody else know that there was this tragedy and uh, because there was no no telephones, no wireless, nothing. We just hadn't was out in the wilderness. The site is dedicated to Rosalind Tiny and Wishi and is the only known death due to avalanche in Australia. Michael explores the historic ruins. It's just an amazing thing. So much of a time capsule that's just left here undisturbed. Uh, the ashes are still strewn around the place as if nothing's been touched. Um, it was an achievement in its time and uh, I've got to give them credit for what's, uh, what these guys have done and the, uh, and the actual hardships that they went through. You know, the loss of the only life we've lost in the snow due to avalanche and uh, the, the loss of a lift that was our, I would have to say, gave to some of the best ski runs that this country could ever possibly have, but no longer drops to exists, etc. What we see here. It's like an old VW battery. The size amazing. of it, six boulder, I'd say. It's like Mum used to have in the old V dub. Access to the high country wilderness has been restricted since the loss of the hut and tow rope. The lack of accommodation and uphill transport ensures only a small number of dedicated adventurers see this part of the country. Yet the area's natural beauty of granite and snow is unsurpassed. It is protected by the National Parks and Wildlife Service. No over snow transport or heavy machinery is allowed to ensure the permanence of life within this fragile alpine zone. The beauty is reserved for those brave enough to journey into the wilderness unassisted and leave only memories that they were here behind. Look at the kite. And then we had to end up building hey, it's beautiful. A la palace. Yeah. A little bit more work tomorrow and we'll make a few rooms. Yeah, the Golden Eagle Lodge. Golden. <laughs> and all we've got to do now, boys, is worry about going fast. Yeah. Right. We're going to go fast. Snow so Dad good. was um, yeah. extremely good. If the, uh, pretty wild back then. It's, uh, Know, ripping around the Charlotte's Pass on an old BSA and you know a bit of a wild boy in our helmets and stuff and when the idea came up to go pretty quick down a very steep hill he was like jumping for joy you know he just wanted to go for it so yeah mum basically uh, taped him up and pinned him up and didn't even want to go out and watch him do it though didn't want him to do it but he loved it and yeah did well out of it so his time hasn't been beaten yet, and mm -hmm. tomorrow or the next day, hopefully, uh, we're going to go out to do it. Yes, go Most out definitely. and smack it to hell. Say, so, Dad, you're only trotting down the hill. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah but the equipment and uh, everything is a lot to change. That's yeah. half the reason we're out here, is just to remember their, their bravery. For sure. All, they're For sure. all in there. 60s, 70s, 80s now, the guys who were out here at the time, in the 50s, doing the gold. Yeah, so and, uh, I think he had more balls than what we do to do it on that sort of shit. I think so. I mean, yes. the old fellas, you got to take your, hand, your hats off to them. Yeah. They, at the end of the day, they were doing it on very primitive equipment yeah. without precedent. Yeah, yeah without. We're, yeah. yeah. we're just across the valley from where Rosalind Welsh was killed in 56, mm. in the Kunama hut tragedy across, across the valley. Yeah. Her spirit would be floating around here right now. Guarantee yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, I'm stoked to be out here, man, because I've been amped on speed scheme for ages and I've never had the chance to do it fast in Australia before, man. The biggest problem, Australian people don't usually know what my speed snowboarding is, they don't see it here, so mm. we're going to get to do this recreation of the historical event. This hill's going to be excellent, man. I don't know if we're going to be able to go quite 196 like I got to go in Lazark last time. That was pretty good, good but Three here points. looks like we might even get 160s out of it, man, and to do that in Australia is going to be even better. 100 miles an hour. Yeah. That'd be unreal, eh? Sure. Yep. Do the real Golden Eagle. Straight from the top. I do. I was excited. Not afraid, because if you're afraid, I'm a strong believer. Pull out. You've got to be prepared. Take it, or otherwise just abandon. That's always been uh, the, it's the worst thing you can do because you're looking for exit. You definitely weaken yourself. Your mind, it doesn't work. Now, I was rather excited, and... Uh, it's bloody cold. <laughs> oh, the track should be unreal, man. And the f door's frozen. Yeah, oh. <coughs> a very personal, um, very meaningful thing for me, and I'm proud, very proud to be out here and doing this. It's it's really a part of Australian history that's going to be done here today, and I'm glad to be one of the people that's out here doing it. Very proud. Yeah, and I think my father will be too. He'll uh, he'll be Just happy to one see one. his old record broken. Oh, man. Uh, I think he said to me the last okay, time that's a Thank week ago you. that it's about time someone went out and did it. So we're here to do it today, and that's a definite. Be sure. been travel waxed up since Europe. Nice thick hard coating of good stuff. Yeah, yesterday we spent most of the day preparing the course, uh, which is a, a major thing for safety and to get a good time, obviously. Um, the process of that was basically stepping it, sidestepping the, the length of the course and then slipping it as smooth and possible as we could get. That's the bit, Mick, where you're coming into that dip. Yeah. Uh, being bad weather, we really had a couple of short runs. Um, intermittent fog coming in sort of preventing us to do much. But that prepped us up for a beautiful day today. The course turned out great and today we're, I think we're going to go out and smash a few records. It's, uh, it's looking fantastic and uh, all the boys are really keen. It's looking really good.
but the way I see it, you know, from our old people, they established a tradition here out of speed skiing in this Kanama Valley, Gunama. And here it is now. I hope more people will come back and be able to experience this beautiful, clean place. The magic of the high country Australia. Australian speed skiing records have been broken. The son came and took the record from the father. Maybe this is the start of a new speed skiing realm for Australia. If we can run this little site in a really clean, beautiful way over a month in the season, who knows where it might go. We might hit that magical 200, which I think there's quite a few aspirants to that one now. Hey, what we're actually doing here, just before we head out, is sealing up the entrances to our snow caves for two reasons. One, if somebody comes back out, wants to use it, and there's been a storm since we've left, it's not going to fill in with snow, and uh, all our hard work and effort building it gone to vain. And the other main reason is that if once it starts to, to thaw a bit more and the roof gets a lot thinner, they collapse in. So uh, the, this will more or less be like a, a barrier. People will look in and it'll pull them up without going directly in. When she gets a bit thin and it's not going to collapse on their heads in it, at all. So it's a bit of prevention there and gets a bit more use. What is it, Carl? This is lentils a la gunama. <laughs> Gunama Valley lentils. Is that what they are? Yeah, it's lentils. Real straightforward tucker. Just plain lentils? Nice special. Tastes pretty good though. Got the extra special oh. rice flavouring. I'm up here on the stuff. slope into the river down there, mm. and at the end of the day, it's going to destroy this whole area. So when you come up here, do somewhere that it, where it can be taken out. I'm feeling unreal, feeling good what we've done here over the last four days and it's actually pretty sad to be walking out of here but we're on our way so 